You're watching the American Express Halftime Report. Time is running out to enroll. MX card members sign up for the Shop Small Offer by August 23rd. Afros! Yeah! Jared Allen, he has 10, 8, and 2 blocks as the Brooklyn Nets are up by three at halftime, and we are in the American Express Halftime Report. Ro Parrish here along with Steve Smith and Sekou Smith. Listen, we heard the report by Stephanie Reddy during the game, Jacques Vaughn challenging Karis LeVert to be more of a facilitator. He responded in the game one with 15 assists, and Smitty, he's doing the same today, 12 points and seven assists at the half. What do you see? What am I seeing right now is a young man getting comfortable playing, you know, facilitator. He can score the basketball flat out and plays extremely well without it. Now, Jock Vaughn has implored him to be, hey, let's be the point guard because they're paying a lot of attention to him. And you can see he's making these passes, Sekou, and roll on the dime. He's looking as a natural point guard right now, having a good time, and he's taking his challenge and feeling good about it. But he's not forgetting that he can flat out score the basketball. Here's somebody that is having a not a great shooting night. 12, only has 12 points. He shot it 13 times, shooting a horrible percentage, but he's made a huge impact. And yes, Fred Vedley, one of those guys, a great defender getting, getting up under him. As you can see, patience, look away, letting the play develop. You don't see this much from a young guy at this stage. He hasn't played a lot of basketball because of injuries, but he looks very comfortable. Karis LeVert, very comfortable as the Brooklyn Nets have the lead. Going to the other side, the Toronto Raptors say, who Pascal Siakam, you talk about him in the pregame. He responds admirably in the first half with 16 big buckets. Yeah, and they needed every one of them. Um, you know, they got in that big hole. Hmm. Brooklyn came out and played with some great energy. But you saw the Raptors, when they locked down and really started digging in and, and running their offense, they get quality shots. And, and Pascal Siakam was huge in that regard. They get the 13-0 run to get back in the game. Haven't quite, to me, gotten in a, in a full rhythm yet, but certainly on track for that. And a lot of it is due to Siakam just coming out and playing with a real determination. A lot of it due to Siakam. Then you have Norman Powell coming off the bench. The Raptors did not lead this whole game until the three-minute mark. A lot of explosion coming off the bench with Powell. Guys that attack. And I love the way he goes extremely hard. Definitely he can shoot the three. He's developed that, but he's that energy guy. That dunk he had was spectacular. You talk about he rolls up over somebody and just put it down. I jumped up out of my couch when I saw that one. I like what he's bringing the energy, but I also got to say right now for the Raptors, they're going to have to find a way to get some rhythm to their offense because right now, even though the Brooklyn Nets haven't shot it well, this is a team that hadn't turned it over and they're keeping the Toronto Raptors off the line. Toronto Raptors haven't shot it nearly as well as they did when they knocked down a franchise record 22 threes, shooting six for 22. That's these Milwaukee Bucks. This is obviously not how they planned it. They didn't necessarily look the best in the restart. Smitty, should the Bucks be worried after this first game against Orlando? Well, I think the Bucks need to look themselves in the mirror and said, we hang our hat on defense, and it was not there at all. When you look at Orlando, they shot, what, 50, close to 40, 94% from the line, almost a 50, 40, 90 game for a team, the Orlando Magic. And the best player on the floor was Vucevic for me in their last outing. What was special about him, Sekou and Rowe, he did not have a free throw attempt. He had 35 points, so he was getting buckets. And that's why I'm going to have to circle Robin Lopez, Brooke Lopez, the Twins. They might even have to play together. There's no way they got to let him dominate the game the way they did and not at least send him to the free throw line. Somebody's going to have to touch Vucevic, and they did not. He was the more aggressive, and he knocked down shots. He kept them off balance. He was the guy picking and popping, looking like Brooke Lopez. He was fantastic, and he's been playing solid basketball for a number of years. Efficiently, you talk about those 35 points. He did it on 24 shots, and as you mentioned, didn't even go to the free throw line. But moving to the Bucks, Sekou, they were held to 12 points as far as fast break points go. So that's definitely something that they want to get up. But how big of a disadvantage is it for the Milwaukee Bucks, seeing that they're at this neutral site, and we know how important that home crowd is for this Milwaukee Bucks team? Uh, listen, I think that's a factor for every team that relies on, uh, you know, a raucous home court advantage normally during the postseason but Rose Smitty I think the Bucks have a bigger issue going on right now and I think that's it their role players look like they're operating with a ton of pressure on them they don't look like they're playing comfortable like they're playing easy and everything is just flowing for them outside of George Hill 
they got a lot of guys to me who look uncomfortable in the moment. Maybe they recognize just how important this season is, this postseason for them is, what Giannis has got on the line, what they have on the line as a franchise. But they haven't looked comfortable since they got to Orlando. They haven't been in a rhythm as a group. And to me, that's, a, that's an alarming sign from a team that was as good as they've been all season. You go back to before the shutdown, they had hit a point where they really weren't playing as well, and they've never snapped out of that. I, if I'm Mike Budenholzer and that staff, I'm digging deep into that tape, trying to figure out where we've gone left and, and turn that thing in the other direction because they don't look like a championship-caliber team that's in a real comfort zone right now in the bubble. Smitty, obviously you played in San Antonio for a long time. Bud comes from that coaching tree with Pop. Now, we've seen how Pop in the past, he keeps the minutes in check, managing those minutes. That's how he got to extend Tim Duncan and all those guys' careers. Did something similar this season. When you look at the Bucks. nobody in that rotation has played over 31 minutes per game. Is that something that is turning into a disadvantage right now, seeing that these guys haven't played the majority of minutes? Yeah, I think so, bro, because they don't have any rhythm. I mean, we know Giannis has been phenomenal. Chris Middleton has been great at times, but Eric Bledsoe didn't have enough rhythm for me. Brooke Lopez doesn't look like he's in sync. I think the one guy I think Bud's going to have to play, just because he's one of those X factors for me, say, Kuhn and Rowe, is Sterling Brown, because he just makes things happen. Yes, he might turn it over a couple times, but he's so reckless. They need some guys that can dive, do different things. Right now, like you said, Say could roll guys like they're hesitant. They don't look comfortable. And I think they, if they don't get it right today, they might have to switch it up. And they got to play a little bit faster to me. And some, for some reason, they don't get out and get easy buckets. And in half court, they struggle because they're building a wall against Giannis and it's making it tough. He's getting his points, but he didn't hurt them enough where guys got easy shots and it looked easy for him. Obviously, we're talking about the Bucks, but I just have to throw this out there. This was the first time since 2003 that both eighth seeds beat one seeds, talking about Portland knocking off the Lakers and then the Magic beating the Bucks. Sekou, of these two number one seeds, which one should be more worried moving forward? Wow, that's, that's a great question because I think they have two very distinct issues going on. For the Lakers, it's the opponent. It's who you're dealing with. I think Portland is that dangerous should make you that nervous, um, you know, in terms of their abilities to get out there, score points, put pressure on you, and get you off balance. The Bucks, to me, have more internal issues. Uh, again, I, I reiterate, they have to find that little sweet spot that they play with when Giannis doesn't have to be the, the, the center of all of the attention, but he is. Not that he can't do it. Obviously, he can. But they need to find ways, as Smitty mentioned, to get easier shots for Giannis and for other guys without the pressure building like it did in game one. So I'm, I'm as concerned as I could be for both number one seeds, but I think the Lakers have a little bit more danger to be, you know, a little bit more to be worried about in terms of the opposition and the pressure that Portland can put on you. Well, you go ahead, Smitty. Hey, hey say cool and roll. Is Orlando, do they got home court advantage? <laughs> I said, they, That's a great question. I mean, they might be the one team in the bubble that's got a home court advantage. They look comfortable. They do look comfortable indeed, but let's not get too excited. Remember last season when they played Toronto in the first round, they went and won game one as well, and we know kind of how that worked out. Well, looking in the Western Conference, got something fresh off Twitter. Looking at Kristaps Porzingis, this comes from my homie Tim McMahon. I'm told that Porzingis is dealing with irritation in his right knee but hopes to play the night. This is not the knee with the repaired ACL. Porzingis missed 10 games in the middle of the season due to right knee soreness. Obviously, this is one of the big stories on the first day of the playoffs, Porzingis getting ejected. What happens in this game if he's not available, Smitty? Well, I get a chance to get my popcorn and see more Luka. I mean, I know he won't be able to beat him by himself, but he tried the other night. They had a legit chance in that game one if Porzingis plays. And then I just love the way Rick Carlisle executes. He throws different lineups. He kept the Clippers off balance. But they need Porzingis, obviously, to beat the Clippers. But if they don't have him, they have this guy right now that I'm looking at saying he has a chance. If it's close, he can win the game down the stretch. And they had it close. Just the Clippers just had a little bit more. But Sekou Rowe, it is a treat to watch Luka the Don. It is unbelievable because this is the Clippers. Doc Rivers, T. Lou, defensive-minded coaches with Paul George and Patrick Beverly and Kawhi Leonard, and he still had an amazing game. Man. It was crazy. Early on in that game, we saw those perimeter defenders. They went crazy on Luka. He had a career-high five turnovers in that first quarter. 
But he turned it all around and set the playoff record for most points scored in a debut with 42. Luca, indeed impressive. We'll keep you updated on everything going on with Porzingis. Well, we got more coming for you with Chris Paul. We all know that the NBA is leading the way in terms of amplifying social justice. We hear directly from Chris Paul next. Playoff basketball, it's finally here. Toronto Raptors are dangerous. Count it and one. This guy's a